Today we're reading the story, The Boys Who Fought the Nazis. This is a narrative nonfiction, which means it reads like fiction, but it's actually all true. It's based on a, a larger book about the experiences of these three boys during the war and the rise to, of Nazis in Germany. So the questions for this book are set up a little bit differently, or for this article are set up a little bit differently. First, we're gonna go through and look at the text features and do some before reading work. And then we're going to pay attention to some vocabulary words during our reading. And then after the reading, we're gonna go back into the text, again then for the third time, to respond to the questions on the second and third pages of your packet. So you can write your answers down on the paper in front of you, or you can type your answers in to the Google Doc that has been shared in Google Classroom right here. So first it says, um, our, our learning target, I can draw evidence from informational texts to support analysis and reflection. So as we read the title and subtitle, here's our first question before reading, read the title and subtitle on pages four and five, write the subtitle here. So if we look at the whole book, right, this was like a centerfold of a scholastic magazine. The full title of this story, and I'm sorry the sizing doesn't line up right here, but the full title of the story is The Boys Who Fought the Nazis. The subtitle is above the text, but you know it's a subtitle because the words are smaller, is how three friends risked their lives fighting against one of the most evil regimes the world has ever seen. So on your paper or in your doc, you're going to write the subtitle, how three friends risked their lives fighting against one of the most evil regimes the world has ever seen. So that's the answer to the first question. Now we're gonna analyze the two pictures on pages four and five and their captions. What does each picture show and why do you think these two pictures were placed together? So again, we're gonna pop back over here and um, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit so you can see this picture larger here. So we're looking at this picture, and remember, this is a centerfold, so these two pictures would have been, this would have been placed right next to each other as you open up the, the text. And it says here in the caption, um, Adolf Hitler, third from right, so he's over here, third from right on the smaller side, and Nazi officials march through the streets of Munich, Germany, 1938. And then the inset, this says inset to the left, and that's this picture of the boys over here, uh, is Rudy Wobe, 15, right here, Helmuth Hebner, 16, and Karl Heinz Schnabe, Schnabe, Schneeb, don't know how to pronounce it, uh, 17. So these three boys, 15, 16, and 17, um, compared to this whole big group of Nazis marching through the streets of Munich. You can see they've got big cauldrons up here with fire burning. There's Nazi flags hanging from the, from the buildings. So as you look at these two pictures, what does each picture show, right? One picture shows the three boys just hanging out, maybe on a Sunday afternoon, getting their picture taken. And then the other picture, this big show of force as the Nazis march through the streets of Munich in this massive parade, okay? Why do you think these two pictures were placed together? So I want you to go ahead and t pause for a moment, think about that, and write down your answer. Okay, now we're going to look, I'm gonna scroll down here, and there's Hitler again in the larger picture. We'll go back over to the questions. So as you, or so if you read the as you read think about box, that's this one right here, um, on page five, what does it tell you to think about as you read? So it says, 
what role do truth and information play in this story? So as we're reading this um, story about these three boys, again, it's a true story. Um, think about what role do truth and information play in the story of these boys and how they um, interacted with what was happening in Germany at the time. Okay, so again, here's the picture of the boys. We're going to continue to scroll down as we look at the text features, right? We've got this image here of, it says, the Hitler Youth March in a Nazi Rally in Nuremberg, Germany in 1933. Um, the Hitler Youth had 50,000 members. At the beginning of 1933, the Hitler Youth had 50,000 members. By 1936, membership had increased to 5.4 million. Now, that is a lot of boys participating. So the next thing we're supposed to do is we're supposed to examine this map here on page six. What can you conclude? What does it tell you about Nazi Germany? So if we look at this image, and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. Okay, so the caption says, um, this map shows Europe in 1942. What can you conclude about Nazi Germany? So as we look at this, we see that the red is area controlled by Nazi Germany in 1942. The green are allied countries and the kind of grayish color are neutral countries. So countries that did not have anything to do with fighting in the war. So the Soviet Union and Great Britain were allied countries and everything else here in red was Nazi Germany controlled territory. So take a minute and think about what can you conclude or what does it tell you about Nazi Germany when you look at this map? Pause, write something down, and then we'll move on. Okay. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at, we've got some bolded words here, regime, scapegoat, outlandish. So we're going to want to be aware of those vocabulary words as we read our text. We've got an image here of a shortwave radio. Um, that's the type of radio that they used back then. It could pick up the secret broadcasts and the things that Hitler didn't want. Germans to hear. Um, we see some more words highlighted here. We've got another picture and it says, our next question, analyze the Night of the Broken Glass photos on page seven and read the caption. Why do you think information, why do you think information about it was included in the article? So why do you think, um, and I'll, I'll give you a little he heads up, they don't mention the Night of the Broken Glass in the article at all, other than to include this image. So if we read this, it says, on November 9th, 1938, the Night of the Broken Glass, violence erupted against German Jews. Synagogues like the one shown here were burned. Jewish hospitals, schools, stores, and homes were looted. Looting means they break in and they steal all their stuff. So they were robbed. Um, and destroyed. Also, they bust things up. Dozens of people were murdered. The police did nothing. The next day, many Nazis openly celebrated what they had done. So you can see here this burned out synagogue, which is a place of worship for Jewish people. And then you can see in this inset picture that uh, people are walking past all of these broken shop windows. Okay. So you're supposed to think about why do you think this information was included in the video or in the article, this image. So pause and take a moment to do that. Write down your answer and then continue. Okay. The next thing we're supposed to do is analyze. Oh, I'm sorry. We just did that. Scroll down the questions, Miss Anderson. Here we go. 
Consider the three images on pages eight and nine. Read their captions. What emotions, feelings, or ideas do you have about the image on page eight, that's this one right here, compared to the two images on page nine? So let's read the caption to this picture. It says, this photo shows children in Auschwitz, one of the six death camps the Nazis built between 1933 and 1945. The Nazis murdered more than six million European Jews. Many were murdered in camps like this one. Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, gypsies, gay people, and other groups the Nazis considered inferior were also murdered. This mass killing would later be called the Holocaust. So that's the first image that we're looking at. And then the, the other two images are on the next page. So we're going to scroll down and look at those. This is our first one here. It says, this 1930s Nazi poster reads, the German student fights for the Fuhrer and the people. Again, the Fuhrer means the leader. That was what they called Hitler. So it's asking you to think about what message does this poster send? Then, we're, again, we're comparing that picture of the poster to the kids in the striped pajamas here. We scroll down, and here's another image. In the Hitler Youth, boys received military training and fought mock battles. They were being trained as future Nazi leaders. Now, the young Volk, which if you remember, the boy joined in our book Friedrich, was for boys ages eight to 12, uh, or eight to 13. At 14, the boys would graduate from the young Volk and join the Hitler Youth. And it became much more about military, marching, mock battles, training them to become soldiers and future leaders in the Nazi party. So again, our assignment here is to consider these three images, the boy with a rocket propelled grenade launcher here, the propaganda f picture of a young boy um, uh, saying the German student fights for the Fuhrer and the people, and comparing that to this photo of Jewish children at Auschwitz, one of the six death camps that were built during the war. Now keep in mind, there's death camps, there's work camps, there's concentration camps. They were all horrible places and people died at all of them, but death camps like Auschwitz were built specifically to kill the Jews. So take a moment to write down the emotions, feelings, or ideas that you have comparing these three images to each other. Okay, during the reading is our next assignment. So we've kind of done our walkthrough. Let's scroll down and see if we've got any other pictures or captions or things we need to look at. Okay, here's a picture of Helmuth at age 17. All right, that's the last picture. So again, we're going to go back up to the beginning now of the story. And it's telling us to watch out for certain vocabulary words as we read the story. And highlight or underline them in your text as you follow along. We are looking for regime, which is rulership, government leadership, or people in charge of the country. So when we talk about the regime that's in power, we're talking about who's the group of people that are in charge. Anti-Semitism is the hatred of Jewish people or is against Jews. So against Jewish people, anti or against. Scapegoat is a person or group of people who are blamed for a problem, even if it wasn't their fault. Scapegoating is finding someone else to blame for things, for the bad things that happen. Again. The key here is it's not really their fault. You're just looking for someone to blame. Outlandish, ridiculous, ridiculous looking or sounding, 
bizarre or unfamiliar, often untrue. So if something is referred to as being outlandish, it's kind of, it's just ridiculous and not true. Um, and then resistor. A resistor is someone who resists. So anyone who actively opposes or fights against the policies of a government um, could be considered a resistor. So that's what we're going to look for as we read through this article right now. Now I'm going to bump you ahead a little bit. Normally this would be a group activity, but we're also going to pay attention, as it says here, to highlighting um, events and dates and any other information that you might think is important. And if you scroll or you scan down to the, the next part of this page, it tells you that we're going to be looking to put these events in a sequence. So watch for the highlighted portions that talk about when Helmuth shows a shortwave radio to Carl, Night of the Broken Glass, the Nazis coming to power, Helmuth being executed, Carl and Rudy being arrested, and Carl joining the Young Volk. So these are all out of order currently. And what we're looking for is the day, if possible, but certainly the month and the year that these events took place. And then you're going to type the year in right here. And then you're going to write underneath it what happened first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So you're going to put these events in order. All right, let's read this article as we watch for our vocabulary words and we look for these events as they happen. The Boys Who Fought the Nazis, Three Friends, How Three Friends Risked Their Lives Fighting Against One of the Most Evil Regimes the World Has Ever Seen. It was a dark and terrifying night in Hamburg, Germany, and 17-year-old Karl Heinz Schne Schneeby ran through the empty streets. Germany was at war and there were rumors that British bombers were prowling the sky looking for targets to destroy. Carl should have been at home with his parents, safe in a bomb shelter, in the bomb shelter. But fear of bombs was not the reason Carl was drenched in sweat, why his heart pounded louder than the click click of his boots on the street, why he swallowed down the vomit that stubbornly rose into his throat again and again. Carl was on a secret mission. If anyone caught him, he could be shot or worse. Total control. It was December 1941, and life in Germany was dangerous. The country was under the control of Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party. In all of human history, few regimes have been more profoundly evil than Hitler's Nazi Germany. You'll note that the vocabulary words are highlighted in purple. Hitler had come to power after a period of great difficulty. Unemployment was high. Many Germans felt bitter and humiliated by their defeat in World War I. Hitler gave the German people something to blame, someone to blame for their problems, Jewish people. Prejudice against Jewish people, known as anti-Semitism, had existed in Europe for centuries. European Jews were resented and mistrusted for being different and for having different customs and different beliefs. Many times over the years, leaders had turned the Jews into scapegoats, blaming them for the problems ranging from the plague to World War I. Of course, these claims were outlandish, but embers of these old beliefs smoldered in German culture. Hitler easily fanned the flames. He singled out other groups as well, Catholics, the disabled, gypsies, gay people, but the Jews were his primary target. In speech after speech, he called them vermin and said they were to blame for all of Germany's woes. Many Germans embraced Hitler and the Nazi party and all it stood for. Those who did not learn to keep quiet, resistors, were marked as traitors and swiftly killed. Even Karl's parents, who often expressed their hatred of Hitler in private, dared not interfere. One day, as Karl was coming home, he saw armed Nazi officers spitting on a group of German Jews. Upset, 
Carl ran home and told his mother, Son, it is best you forget what you saw. Carl remembered her saying that that is the way our lives will be now. But Carl could not forget. He and his two best friends, Helmuth Hubner, and Rudy, 16, and Rudy Wobe, 15, hated what Hitler stood for. Hitler promised to restore German pride and glory, but like many, the three boys believed that Hitler's real interest was in his own power. Hitler gave himself the title of Führer, or Supreme Leader, and began invading Germany's neighbors, igniting World War II. The boys believed Hitler was destroying Germany. But what could three teenagers do against Hitler? Three friends, one plan. In July 1941, Helmuth invited Carl over to his apartment to show him something special, a shortwave radio. The sight of the radio shocked and thrilled Carl. He knew it could pick up British broadcasts. Listening to foreign radio stations was forbidden, and the penalties were severe. In Nazi Germany, freedom of speech did not exist, as it does in the United States. Newspapers and radio stations were expected to praise Hitler and the war, or they would be shut down. At 10 p.m., Hitler turned on the radio. A voice crackled to life. The BBC London presents news in German. What followed would change the course of Karl's life, as well as the lives of his friends. The report talked about what was happening in Russia which Hitler had recently invaded. The report confirmed the boys' suspicions that the Nazis were lying to the German people, that the war was wrong, and that Hitler was sending Germans into battles they couldn't win. For the next few months, Karl and his friend Rudy would go to Helmuth's to listen to the radio as often as they could. Soon, though, listening wasn't enough, particularly for Helmuth. He wanted to do something. He wanted all Germans to know the truth. So he hatched a bold plan. He began typing up he began typing up leaflets that criticized Hitler, the Nazis and the war. Hitler the murderer read one pamphlet. Do you know you are being lied to? read another. Rudy, Karl and Helmuth would drop these leaflets in public places around Hamburg. It was this mission that had brought Karl onto the blacked out streets of Hamburg that night in 1941. His job was to distribute those leaflets throughout the city, to stuff them into mailboxes and leave them on park benches. He expected the, the Gestapo, the terrifying Nazi police, to jump out from the shadows at any moment. But he made it home safely. Karl's mission had been a success. Swept up. Karl hadn't always despised the Nazis. In fact, he used to be one of them. Like many Germans, he had been swept up in the excitement of the Nazi when the Nazis first came to power in 1933. He loved going to concerts given by the military and police bands. The grand Nazi speeches impressed him. Against his wishes, his parents' wishes, Karl joined the Nazi club for boys called Jungvolk or Young Folk. In 1930 in 1936, he was 12 years old. His friends, Helmuth and Rudy, also joined. At first, Carl liked it. He got to take fun weekend trips to the countryside to hike and camp. On weeknights, he and the other children memorized facts about Hitler, as well as the racist ideas of Nazism. Across Germany, millions of children like Carl were being taught to hate. The games ended. To Carl, the young Volk was mostly fun and games. In 1938, when he turned 14, he graduated into the Hitler Youth, the Nazi group. Every racially pure teenage boy in Germany was expected to join. Then the games ended. The Hitler Youth, as well as the Young Volk and the League of German Girls, were tools the Nazis used to shape the beliefs, thoughts, and actions of German youth. Boys in the Hitler Youth fired real guns. They wore military uniforms, fought pretend battles, and were assigned ranks. They're training us to be soldiers, Helmuth angrily said to Karl one day. He was right. 
In most German cities, Hitler youth were organized into patrols, kind of like junior police squads. One of their jobs was to find out who was disloyal and report them to the Gestapo, known for Gestapo, known for its cruelty. Occasionally, kids reported their own parents. Karl soon grew to resent the Hitler youth. He stopped wearing his uniform and began skipping meetings. By the end of the year, Karl, to his relief, was expelled. He had escaped the Hitler youth, but as he would soon find out, he could not escape the Nazis. Caught. In the final months of 1941, the boys stepped up their resistance. They became more confident and more daring, churning out more than 40 different pamphlets. They pasted flyers on bulletin boards and even dropped them into coat pockets of high-ranking Nazi officials. Meanwhile, the Gestapo was desperately searching for those responsible. The boys took precautions. They stopped sitting together at their church and made sure they were rarely seen together in public. They also made a pact. If one of them was caught, he would assume full responsibility for the entire scheme, no matter what. The Nazi authorities soon closed in, and on February 5, 1942, Helmuth Hebner was arrested. The Gestapo tortured Helmuth for two days. They refused to believe that he had acted alone. Finally, he broke down and mentioned Carl and Rudy. On the morning of February 10th, the boys were arrested. The first night in prison, Carl cried himself to sleep. What had Helmuth told the Nazis? Would Rudy confess? What would happen to their families? For several weeks, Carl and Rudy were held in separate cells, interrogated and brutally beaten. At one point, as Carl was taken for yet another interrogation, he caught a glimpse of Helmuth, his bruised face swollen and his face swollen and bruised. As I passed him, he grinned a little, winked his eyes a bit. Carl remembered. In that moment, Carl knew in his heart that Helmuth had kept the pact. Indeed, Helmuth had assumed all the blame. He told the Gestapo that Rudy and Carl knew about the leaflets, but that was all. He said nothing about their nighttime missions. Helmuth had saved their lives. The verdict. In August 1942, the boys stood before a judge to hear their punishment. Carl's father, heartbroken, was the only family member at the trial. Carl and Rudy were sentenced to hard labor in a prison camp. Helmuth was sentenced to death. After the sentences were read, Helmuth stood and faced the judges, his face calm. Now I must die, even though I've committed no crime, he said. So now it is my turn, but your turn will come. Two months later, Helmuth was beheaded. He was 17 years old. After the trial, Carl was shipped off to a prison camp. Life was brutal. He rarely had enough to eat, and he was often beaten. He longed for his family. After it all, in the final days of World War II, Hitler committed suicide to avoid capture. By the time the war, had, the war ended, 53 million people had been killed. Many Nazi leaders were put on trial and executed for their crimes. Yet the end of the war was not the end of Karl's ordeal. Karl was taken prisoner by the Russians, one of Germany's wartime enemies. They did not believe that he had been a resistor. It would be four more years before he was finally released. Sick and haggard, his years in the prison camps had robbed him of his youth. Carl's parents were overjoyed to be reunited with their son, but they could not deny that he had changed. Though his physical wounds eventually healed, it would be many years before his emotional scars began to fade. Carl eventually discovered a way to live again and even found happiness. He and Rudy moved to America and spent the rest of their lives in Salt Lake City, Utah. They both got married and raised families. They grew old together as dear friends, and they never forgot Helmuth, their brave friend who believed so deeply in the truth. Both Rudy and Carl wrote books about him. 
in 1985, four decades after being branded as traitors, Carl and Rudy were invited to Hamburg to attend a memorial for Helmut. They were given medals of honor. I'm not a hero, Helmuth Hubner is my hero, Carl told Susan Campbell Bar Barlotti before his death in 2010. I do not regret one thing. If we had to do, if we had to, I'd do it again. Now your assignment is to determine with your or on your own what is the order that these uh what is the date that these events took place and what is the order that they took place in the additional pieces here are for, or were originally for you to do with a group to discuss so because we don't have that opportunity right now as we're separated from each other these are how you can get a 3.5 or a 4. If you want a 3.5, you need to respond below with a main idea and a third piece of evidence to respond to, to complete this paragraph. So again, below are two pieces of supporting evidence for the main idea and claim of the boys who fought the Nazis on pages 5 through 7. In the space provided, write a main idea that this evidence supports. Then find a third piece of evidence that also supports your main idea. And remember to include the page numbers in parentheses behind your quote. So you're going to write a main idea and a piece of evidence. If you want a 3.5, you need to complete this question and this question, which says below is another main idea claim of the boys who fought the Nazis from pages seven through 10. Find three pieces of evidence to support this main idea. So in this one, it gives you the main idea. Carl Helmuth and Rudy demonstrated remarkable courage in their resistance to the Nazis. So now between pages seven and 10, you need to find three pieces of evidence that support that main idea and remember to include page numbers. In order to get a four, you need to do these two questions and you need to write a five to seven sentence summary of the boys who fought the Nazis. Think about what would you, what you would say to a friend who asks what this article is about. Make sure you include the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how of the story in your summary. Please let me know if you have any questions. Good luck.